Hi guys, welcome to another episode of Overnight Success. My name is Maya Idowu and today I'm joined by one of my favorite content creators and ops. <laughs> Her name is Jola Aye. Hi Jola. Hello. How are you doing? I'm okay. Are you sure you're okay? No, I'm okay. I'm okay, okay now. <laughs> okay. So the first question I have for you is, mm. if you had to have sex with a horse one time and everybody knew. Okay. Or you had to have sex with a horse ten times and nobody knew. Which one would you rather? I'd honestly rather die. Well, I'd, <laughs> I'd quite frankly just not have an op. Like I, <laughs> I'd honestly. You have to pick one. I'll, I'll call TMT. I feel like TMT will tell you to do it ten times. Ten times, and then nobody will find out. But then TMT will be like, guys, you know what happened? Jola called me. <laughs> Jola called me, and <laughs> that's exactly what will happen. Yeah. And that's how the story. Will and that's go how on. the story will go. So yeah. it makes more sense to do it the one time. <laughs> no, I. Do <laughs> I can't even fathom. How is this a question? It is. It's just, I can't, it I'm is. sorry, I can't answer that question. Okay. Hi, my name is Maya Waido. I'm a lawyer, writer, and journalist, and I'm also editor in chief for Culture Custodian. Overnight Success is an interview series where I speak to some of my favorite creators and entrepreneurs on the journeys and stories that got them to where they are. That is, young, successful people doing interesting things. I don't think there's any such thing as an overnight success, or is there? Find out more by watching this video. And when you're done, please subscribe, like the video, leave a comment, and share it with as many people as possible. Thank you. Hi guys, welcome to another episode of Overnight Success. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm very curious, like when I talk to people, I'm always trying to understand mm -hmm. how they grew up, what they went into as like children. So talk to me about five-year-old Jola. What was she like? Oh, uh, I've always been pretty like talkative, rambunctious. I've always had like a big personality. I've never been, ever been called like a quiet child or a shy child. That was never, nobody ever said, oh, she's so quiet, oh, she's shy, she's reserved. Um, so I was always pretty rambunctious. Um, I liked school. Mm, that was interesting. Yeah, because I like people. Um, so I really enjoyed school. Um, yeah, I, I, I've never had a single ambition. I knew some people were like, I want to be a lawyer. I want to be, every time you ask me, like, the thing will change. I was just very curious um, and rambunctious and, like, yeah, I was a lively child, yeah. Okay, so you were the first child. Yes. And you are the first daughter. Mm -hmm. How did that, like, impact or, like, influence your personality? I think I have a bit of a, like, a type A personality. <laughs> and that comes from, like, being vested authority, you know, because you're in charge. Your parents are like, you are going to take care of this and you are going to do that. So I already kind of, I think I already had a natural inclination, but that also meant that like, um, I was told, I, I don't know if it worked out, but I was told to be responsible. Responsibility was a little bit, you know, that was kind of pushed on me as a kid. Um, but because you have to be like in charge of your brothers, where are your brothers? If something goes wrong, what were you looking at? Where were you? <laughs> um, so there's that dynamic, but then there was assumed there was also like an assumption of capacity, which sounds strange, but like, cause I mean, now when I think about it, like my parents were, my mom had her last child when she was my age. When she was 30. <laughs> yeah, exactly. My mom was 30, 30 and was like pregnant with her third child. So when mm -hmm. I think about it, like they, those guys really didn't know what they were doing to be quite honest. Like they are just, they were just figuring it out as they went along. So there was a lot of like the assumption that, oh, she, she will know what to do, like, or she will learn. Um, and I think that has still, like, gone with me to now. Like, I have an attitude where, like, I'll figure it out or I can figure it out. Okay. Um, yeah, so that's a big thing. I don't know, in terms of, like, other dynamics, sometimes I'm very resentful of feeling like I was supposed to be mature and I was supposed to know things. So basically, you feel like maybe there were times when you wanted to be childish and you didn't get that opportunity. Yes, and I feel like in the last, like, Honestly, I feel like in the last like five months in particular, I've just started indulging like almost like some of the not so <laughs> <laughs> or PC things. Yeah, about, about my about my personality. So I don't feel I no longer feel like I should have things like in control or I should know what I'm doing or I should 
just generally which is something that i know comes from childhood like why are you behaving like this like are you a baby I'm like, yeah i'm seven like what what, <laughs> what do you mean am i a baby but that happens when you're the first child actually a first girl in in nigerian home there's a lot of like from young there's a lot of like you need to be responsible that's why did you learn how to cook okay so the cooking story is interesting because so my mom really tried with me but and that's this is up until today we bought heads so i didn't actually learn to cook from my mom I learned to cook when I left home, when I went to university. Okay. Because, and I had, I was able to do that at Shakara because YouTube had become a thing. CCME. Yes. <laughs> CCME taught me how to cook. Yeah. CCME and Jemima and a bunch of people told me how to cook. But I just felt like in the kitchen, my mom would get so flustered because there's this thing, and I don't know if other Nigerian girls will get this, where sometimes your mom would be like, how come you don't know how to? And you'd be looking at her like, babe, I'm here for the first time with you. Where, what do you mean, how come I don't know? How, where will I learn this from? <laughs> So that was a whole thing and our personalities are quite different so my mom and i would clash all the time so i would end up not really learning anything like half of my alleged cooking lessons would end in tears because my mom would just be screaming and i was just like why am i here with pepper in my eye and i've still not learned anything um so i didn't learn until i was like what is considered like a travesty i was like 16, 17, yeah. when I actually learned. And it was very comfortable because I could make mistakes and it wasn't like a national issue because nobody was really supposed to eat the food except me. So I could like learn at my own pace and that was like really you nice. Know, you saying that reminds me of like once when I, so when I was in high school, I used to do food and nutrition. It's weird. And this year we had like a practical exam. So it was like, you had to make J-Rice. Mm -hmm. I know I made J-Rice and I, didn't put, I forgot to put salt. You forgot to what? I forgot to put salt. And after the, because it looked the nicest. So everyone was like, yo, my wife, I need to taste your J-Rice. I need to taste your J-Rice. And as they were about to, I was like, oh shit, I didn't put salt. So I had to now then like put salt over like in the food. But it's just like that like, um, being able to make mistakes, yeah. like, uh, no yeah. one is going to hold. Exactly. Hold your hand no one's talking it. about how you wasted the ingredients. You are so silly. You are so careless. You are so. <laughs> it was just. It was a much better like experience learning that way. But the thing is now, like I can ask my mom. She's a lot calmer now. I think there was the pressure at the time of feeling like you have one daughter and she's legit like a representation of you everywhere. Yeah. So. And it wasn't even about learning for yourself. It's about learning. It almost felt like, you know, and I think that still happens with a lot of things. You're not just doing things for yourself. For society. Yeah, this, yeah, this like embodiment of all the things your family has gotten right or wrong, wherever you go. So the pressure wasn't to learn to cook so that you can survive. It was so you won't disgrace me outside. And that, that was pressure in and of itself. So, yeah. But I think like that's very, disgrace is a very key part of like Nigerian society. Yeah, and upbringing. That's it. for most people. That is like how you teach consequences. It's not mm -hmm. so. It's like someone borrows money, and instead of you know going about getting the money the correct way, your next instinct is to advertise it in the newspapers or yeah. send every contact they have on their phone that yo this person owes money. Yeah. But um, so I was curious, what was like your favorite content medium when you were younger? Um, funny enough, I think. They were like, you know, there were parts of, so I call them the big three, Punch, Guardian, and Vanguard. Mm -hmm. They always had like, once you get to like, I think like three quarters into the- More the cartoons? Not just the cartoons, but that's when it becomes frivolous. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there'll be some story about a man whose wife turned to a goat. Yeah. And then there'll be the cartoons. And then there would be like an interview with like a media personality, the less seri serious yeah, yeah. parts, yeah. Um, I really liked those in newspapers and I always, always, always liked interviews with personalities. So like interviews with local government chairman <laughs> that nobody cares about. <laughs> An interview with like, with like some obscure international NGO personality has come to Nigeria to launch something and then there's an, I always really enjoy just those interviews in the papers that was what i really really i really really liked enjoyed that and my grandfather used to hoard newspapers so every time i'd go to his house there was like a stack a huge stack that i hadn't seen and i would go through all of them and look specifically for the fun parts of 
newspapers. Was there anyone that stands out that you still remember, like in terms of maybe a story or something you read or you learned? Um, there was a so there was this program on I don't know if it was NT or EIT. It was a Yoruba program. It was called Nkombe. It was like about like I remember that big. Yeah, game. there was an interview with the guy in some newspaper. Okay. Yeah, and I remember just being very fascinated because I felt like he was talking and he used to talk in, he used to talk around things. Okay. So I, I remember being confused. I remember clearly being confused as a child, like really and trying to be like, what's he, like, he's not talking straight. Like, what does this thing mean? <laughs> and, but at the same time, I knew I technically shouldn't be reading it. So I couldn't ask my grandparents, like, what does this mean? And so I remember being very confused that, but I'm sure other people are reading it and they get what he's saying because he was, I think he was talking around jazz, sure. so he wasn't trying to be direct. It was very, I remember being like, ah, what does this thing mean? And who can I ask that will know, like exactly how, that would know and tell me what this thing means. So that was one that stuck out um, pretty clearly. But other than that, not really. Did know. you do any like um, content creating as a child? No. You, didn't, you never wrote a book when you were like 10 that no one oh, read? Oh, yeah. Ah, no. I steady. <laughs> steady. Oh, steady. I actually remember there's a time I lived with my grandparents for a while. And I remember my granddad got a little upset with me because he bought like notepads for me to do lessons with. Yeah. And like three days later, I came and told him that I'd finished everything. He was like, but you haven't started lesson. I was like, oh, yeah, I wrote stories. <laughs> <laughs> And he was like, why would you do that? I remember him being very confused as to like, what is this and what is going on here? I used to, oh, steady. I used to write stories. I used to, I couldn't draw. So that was a no-go. And I used to remake songs as well. So I would use the beat of a song. I would write my own whack. <laughs> whack. Oh, they, they were so bad. They were so bad. But I remember, I remember feeling like I was very, and that's another thing, I felt very creative. Like, I felt very like, misunderstood and like I'm very creative and these people don't understand me and I'm going to be a star one day. I remember feeling very strongly about these terrible things I was writing. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I know you're an animal pastor because mm. you've written something. <laughs> I have for culture custodian yeah, actually. Uh, yes. The pearls of being an animal pastor. So yeah. I'm very like, so how did that experience shape you and like what influence did it have on you? I think the main thing actually is a very strong sense of like this is good and this is bad in a good and bad way okay so my family is very my parents are extremely religious but then they also have a very narrow way with which they view like the world like this is right and this is wrong and so for a very long time like i think i had no appreciation for nuance mm -mm. i was just like but that's bad <laughs> Okay, that is a good person, that's a bad person. And this is a good thing, and that's a bad thing. Um, so, I mean, it's a, it was a very good, like, um, internal, like, self-corrector. Um, like, a very strong sense of, like, you know when, you can't pretend you self, you know when you're doing the right thing. Yeah. Um, so there was that. Um, yeah, and, you know, my parents are very good at it, so it didn't matter if they weren't there, God was watching. Mm -mm -mm -mm. God is always watching. Um, so yeah, that's a big thing. But I think the, the biggest thing has always been like having, based on that, just having certain like virtues or like what you will do and what you won't do, just be very clear on what that is. They wish I was a lot more like, we literally had a, there was a whole thing last night about faith. My dad had will go at me about it. Why? Well, <laughs> <laughs> um, so they just wish I was a lot more like steadfast in my faith. My father can't see the world outside of it. He doesn't understand how people make sense of the world outside of faith. It's a big struggle for him. He can't, how do you cope? He, he says it too. He's like, so you're just going to, you just intend to go through life on your own. And I'm like, no, no, on my own. But just not as, I don't think I'm just as interested in being as devoted as you are. Which for him is, he thinks like it's a failure on his part if his children are not as um, grounded in faith. He doesn't care about any other achievements. And I used to think he was taking the piss, but he's completely serious. He doesn't see anything else as important. 
And how do you like manage that conflict? I don't manage it. It never goes well. So you just do what you Yeah, I, no, I think so it's two things. I do have a tendency to like people please. So on the one hand, I would like to really assert myself a lot more. But on the other hand, I don't want to upset them. And I sometimes feel like it's not like they're asking for anything crazy, right? Like they're not asking for a bad thing. Like I don't have parents that are asking me to, to like do anything too insane, right? Like why is joining prayer meeting that big a deal? Mate, like when you think, so I start to like waffle a bit, but on the other hand, and I don't want to break their hearts and be like, I understand, but I just, I just can't find it in me to be the same as you, to have the same level of interest or to have the same level of unwavering belief. I think that's the problem. I think I sometimes feel like the question, <laughs> the questions you, you want answers to have very surface answers and it's not enough anymore and on the other hand it's like but it's not their job right if you want the answers you should go and look for them yourself so far i don't like what i've been finding and then there's the third thing which could be that you get answers and you don't like the answers, answers yeah. so you're not interested in following that tenant but that still causes conflict right it's being like so it's like having your parents believe in 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 so you, you are all Christians or you all believe in the same things, but there are parts you just either disagree with or two, even worse, willfully decide to disobey. And when you grow up in a faith-based home, that's very difficult because you can't be like, oh, I know. And, like, and, and that bother, I think that bothers them more than every other thing. When you're like, oh, I, I know and I understand, but it's not for me. What do, you, what do you mean it's not for you? Do, do you know what hell is? <laughs> but yeah, I think so. That's it. That's that's the main thing. So it, it, it was actually also very nice. So I understood generosity from my parents. They are very, very kind. They are very, very giving of time, resources, energy, space. Um, there was a lot of fantastic stuff growing up in that environment. And I hope I've imbibed enough of them to be considered like a, a, I don't want to use the word good human being, but a person of substance. But there's also stuff that I'm just like, man, I don't know about some of these other things. So it's, there's still that, and I'm close to my, my family is close. Like my mm -hmm. parents went out of their way to try and be very close with their children. So because of that closeness, it can cause like tension because there are also expectations that come with that. Okay. Um, I was going to ask what your first, like, as an adult, like what was the first career ambition you had? I always wanted to work in film and television, but I just didn't know how to assess myself strongly enough to say that that was what I wanted to do. Yeah. But I'll never forget the first time, and my parents still insist that this didn't happen, but my brothers were there. The first time I mentioned film school, my parents laughed, we in the car. I'll never forget, we in the car. And my dad was like, I can't remember what he was saying, and I was like, oh, I want to go to film school and make films. And the two of them looked at each other and started laughing. Because he was like, of course she doesn't. Like, she's vivacious and she sings and dances and does all that stuff. But, like, she's also very good at school. Like, this kid is clever. Of course she's not going to do that. Um, so I actually always wanted to work in entertainment. I didn't know how. And I even meandered with, like, a bunch of stuff. Like, before I started writing, I had a sound. I don't know who I thought I was. I had a SoundCloud. It's still there. I was going to ask you about that. Like, <laughs> it's still there because I can't sing. So there was like a bunch of stuff. Like I was like, oh, I think I want to try this and I think I want to try that. But I wasn't as confident like asserting myself in anything else. So for a long time, I knew I wanted to work in entertainment. I didn't know how. Or where. Or where, yeah. Um, I didn't want to. At the time, I wanted to be an author. I just knew that I wanted to work in, in, in the arts, but I wasn't sure how. Yeah. Okay. So this kind of takes me back to so one of the things I like trolling you about is the fact that you study PPE. <laughs> Only white men study such, especially where you went. Where I went, Sabi. So I'm very curious, like how was that? How was those three years? Oh as hell, I didn't like school. I didn't want to be there. I didn't so like So why did you degree. why did you choose to study that? Because that was the only thing that me and my dad could agree on. He wanted me to study economics. I even dropped the economics. Because I failed it. I was like, what is this? <laughs> they said economics. I thought it was the gisty part. Then I got there, I started seeing math. <laughs> I was like, 
was like, I don't grab. Even in the small PPE degree, you still want us to do math. Is there still space for math? And because it's PPE, you have to do all the compulsory yeah. uh, modules. I was like, hell no. I don't want to. Like, if, if, you, if you take me back to 16-year-old July, I wouldn't go to university in the UK. That's the first thing. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't study politics and philosophy. I would have done like something that Nigerian parents hate. Do you know what that is? Business administration. <laughs> <laughs> Biz admin. <laughs> oh, how unambitious. <laughs> that's what I would have studied because that's what I need. If I didn't have a business partner, I'd be screwed. Figuring out like what actually makes a business go. Yeah. Not the idea, not the finance, like the actual structure. Yeah. I would have just done that because that is the bane of my existence at the moment, like structure of a business. If I had known, I would have just said, guys, let me just go and hustle scholarships and do business administration and come back and be able to make sense of my life. I would not have done my degree. I, those three years, I made friends, Sha. I made friends. Mm -hmm. I knew, I finally understood what, um, um, what's the opposite of overt? Covert. Covert racism was yeah. because of the school I went to. Um, I saw Northern England, lovely mm -hmm. place. Mm -hmm. uh, what else? I, I, I just, the learning was the least of, I was, I just wasn't happy. To How many girls were there on that course? Were there a lot? Not really. So it was Not really. very masculine. It was a very masculine course. And then by the time I moved to just doing politics and philosophy as well, I had a very American view of what my universe. First of all, I was saying college. So that even tells you how dumb. <laughs> I had a very American uh, outlook on what my university experience would be because that's what I used to see. Yeah. There's no like, all the big like college movies are all American. So I thought that, oh, um, uh, <laughs> Only to get to Durham University and be like, hey, what is this? What is going on here? If I had known, I just, it didn't, I'm not going to lie, it didn't really affect, I, I spent my whole time waiting to graduate. I didn't, I had friends who enjoyed their degrees, like as in, yeah. they, the process of learning was so immersive for them and they were so excited about it and they, and for a curious person, that's a bit sad, but I just was just like, I shall go. I, I shall have a degree and then I'll figure out, I'll now start doing yeah. what I want to do. That was what it was like for me. I don't know for, about other people, but that was my university experience. Through no fault of anyone but mine, because if I put my foot down, I, but I didn't like put my foot down. I didn't know that was an option. <laughs> if I didn't know. When did you realize it was an option? When I was 28. That's when I realized that my what, parents... What triggered it? Um, my, that was the first time my dad said, well, you're an adult. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, wait, wait, wait. You mean like this whole time, all these things you'd be saying were suggestions. <laughs> this whole time I could have been like, no, no, this is what I want to do. And you'd have been like, well... I just thought that they were telling. Because, and that's another thing with Nigerian parenting. It takes so long to realize that you're an adult. You have an extended adolescence for the longest time. And then one day your parents start asking you for your thoughts. They're like, which thoughts? Since when is this a democracy? What thought? It's so, it's so bizarre. I remember thinking that, I think I've spoken to my dad about it as well. And he was like, oh, they just thought I needed a lot more guidance. Because I just didn't seem sure. I was like, I didn't know I was allowed to be sure. When, when was I allowed to be sure? When was I, when, when was my judgment enough? When, when was it clear that like, oh, this one has an internal compass that is working? So I don't know, I, it took me a really long time. Even now, sometimes like, I have to remember that you're not a kid. Like that, you know, I'll have an internal panic when my mother says something or my dad says something and it's like replaying in my head. And I have to remember that, baby, you're 30, like you can make a decision that they don't like, or that people that you respect or like or care with. about don't agree with, it's okay to do that. And when you when you've been a good, you know, that's the problem with being a good child. It's always expected. It, it's not just expected. Any deviation is considered rebellion. So the first time 
you you are okay with your parents not agreeing with something you do oh matey <laughs> it's funny because i think i learned that like in old age because my brother has always been like yeah he beat he, like he moves to the sound of his own drum mm -hmm. and he's always made that clear to my parents <laughs> so like they don't even really have exp mm -hmm. like the bare minimum is now like oh he did this like as part he's a good child <laughs> but then with me it's like obviously the expectations mm -hmm. are more because mm -hmm. you've been modeled to be like serious um follow like this like clear line mm -hmm. and yeah so i kind of like what you're saying i kind of like tap into that like mm -hmm. i relate to it so like when you move back to nigeria what like was your what's your mindset like what were you coming to do i'm not going to be an accountant <laughs> so after my university degree which i had spent all this time waiting to pass my dad and i were talking and he was like how do you feel about accounting exams so my dad's thing was always security yeah as most parents right and my dad would say let me tell you something everybody will look for a job but accountants never look for a job. never never you always see him and it's like there's no company in this world that doesn't even illegal entities <laughs> need an accountant um so he was like okay why don't we do like um management accounting exams and i started hoping that i would fail so that it would be clear that this <laughs> is not the path for me but i kept passing these exams <laughs> um, so what happened was i actually had to the i kept passing it was so sad i kept passing and so I came home one Christmas and I told my dad, I'm going back and it doesn't matter what the results are, I'm not doing these exams anymore. And I remember him being very anxious about that entire thing. But what I had done was before that, I started looking for work um, and I got hired by Zikoko. I had a start date, so let's say I moved back to Lagos on a Friday, like two Fridays of two months, like the Monday, yeah. I was supposed to start my new job. Um, but I remember like my dad being like, huh, what is this the coco? What is this thing they do? I was like, oh, it's writing or whatever. And he, they didn't understand. I didn't have, I, my mindset was just like, I just need to figure out how to do what I wanted to do from the beginning, which was work in entertainment and figure out if it was even worth it, if I was any good at it. Like I didn't want more time to go. Because there's nothing like moving through your 20s and feeling like time is going yeah. all the time. Yeah, because obviously Mark Zuckerberg became a billionaire when he was 19. So what are you doing? Really and truly. <laughs> um, so I remember like wanting to come and start so that if it's going to fail, you'll fail early. early and yeah. like I can self-correct on time. That was my only thinking. It wasn't anything else. And I was very miserable. I lived in Manchester by myself. I had a few, by a few friends, I mean three. I had three friends who lived in Manchester at the time as well um, and I just was very unhappy I remember falling in my bathroom once and thinking oh shit if I had died like I don't even know my neighbor like there's nobody looking for me yeah. other than my mother like there's literally nobody I don't have a community here like I remember it's not me to stand up or oh, I'd fallen down in the shower and I was just thinking hey if I had hit my head <laughs> that would be, like nobody's going to find me for a few days and that now put me into a spiral. I was like, until I start smelling. And <laughs> I remember having a whole like spiral about that. So I was like, I have to go back home and try and figure it out. And Nigeria had not fully casted then. Yeah. So I was very optimistic. Um, so that was my thinking. Like, let me go and fail quickly if it's going to fail. And if such should happen, I'll run back to London and humbly continue these accounting exams. Okay. so. What was working as a cooker like? It was amazing. So like that, the, the set I worked with I know, is phenomenal. I know, like I, I can't, know some of those people. I can't explain just how nice it was to work with, like some of the people I worked with. Also, um, to be able to like feel like people say yeah, like you're interesting or you're funny or you can write or you're witty. And to have that be of some use, that's not like a class clown or a family clown, was very, very, <laughs> was very, very nice. Mm -hmm. And I worked with people, um, we didn't know then, obviously. Everybody was just hustling. Yeah. We didn't know then. But then I worked with um, founders of like 
backdrop and buy coins yeah. and piggy vest. But at the time, we were all just suffering and people who like are doing really cool things are like Meta and um, Paystack and... But honestly, as of 2015, 2016, guys were just hoping for the best and, you know, struggling to make things happen. But I saw like there was, and that was the first time I, people were speaking of writing as content. How long were you as a Coco Park? Yeah, a year and a half. Or maybe and then when did you, like when you realized you were leaving or what? So there was like a few problems at the time. Um, and okay, so what first of all happened was like some of my favorite colleagues um, had gone on to do other things. Okay. And like, yeah, we were, the company was in like a really weird space. Um, and we were, I was just really unhappy and I didn't know what to do. Um, and I think I'd finished NYSE as well. Um, so yeah, it was 2017, I think. Um, and I was like, oh, okay. Funny enough, my dad wanted me to stay. Because he's, what, what did he see how much fun you were having with it or what? Well, so I, I'd never complained about my job. Oh, uh, um, yeah. Yeah. And because of the type of dad is, he'd actually come to the place a few times. And he just felt like there's something good here. Like, what's your problem? <laughs> like, and I, I was like, I, and I explained to him and he was just like, no, no, no. These are young people trying to do like a good thing, like give it a shot. And I was like, no. I'm going to try something else. And then I quit without a backup plan. What was the something else? I didn't know. <laughs> oh, <dear. laughs> I had no plan. Mumu. I had no plan. Just at home. Trying to figure out what I would do next. Um, and that was I did some freelance writing. Yeah. But I didn't I didn't know anything. Like I, I feel like I was just like in just groping around, trying to figure out. And then I worked for a few, I had like short stints at a few places. And by that time I become really good friends with my now business partner, Salt Andrew. Um, yeah, and we started doing like, so what would happen at the time was we had like, um, cause he also has a, a, a digital agency, yeah. a small digital agency. So what would happen was, how Salt and Truth started was, John would go and pitch something, and then come and meet me and be like, oh, Mojola, I don't have scripts for this thing. Come and help me write something, or can you help me like with this deck? Or, I remember you meeting me? you guys at like, I think I met John through you, at the first, before you guys even set up Salt and Truth, yeah. but like in the first iteration of whatever it was you mm -hmm. guys were doing, and I think it was already clear, because at the time you would tell me, you'd be like, yo, John knows how to get money. <laughs> yeah. It, it used to bust my brain. Because the guy would just be like, you know, he would just call me. He'd be like, okay, Jola, I'm going to XYZ Bank to pitch this thing. I'd be like, how did you know somebody there? He'd be like, no, no, no. I was doing one work <laughs> and I met this person. I'd be like, eh? Really? And so he'd be like, okay, so what I need you to do is like, help me with the writing, help me with it. And that's how it started. We did one, two, three, four. And then he started talking about like, oh, he's thinking of doing a production company. I was like, oh, I want to do a production company. He was like, oh, do you want to be my business partner? I was like, yeah, I remember it being such a casual. I think I told him to buy me Sharma or something while in the car. Yeah. And that was how it started. And I thought it was just years. Um, on the next thing, John had called lawyer, came to my house. We were talking about like, you know, splits and Structure. profit sharing and, and stuff like that. So that was how, and then we started Salt and Truth in 2018. Um, okay. so. I think one of the things I wanted to talk to you about is like you're, clear, you're part of two successful partnerships. Mm -hmm. So with John Assault and Truth mm -hmm. and with FK with I Said What I Said. Mm -hmm. So I mean you've kind of spoken to how Salt and Truth came about but now to like how I Said What I Said came about mm -hmm. and what it is about those people that make them good partners. So in general I don't believe in uh, sole proprietorship. Mm -hmm. um, based on my personality and my varied interests. I don't really see myself doing anything alone. Um, I don't want to do anything alone. Um, 
particularly given now that I have technically two businesses, I, I know how tough doing anything in Nigeria is and I need the tears to go around. I can't cry on my own. <laughs> I can't build on my own with the way the Nigerian landscape is. I'm very, very in awe of people who are able to, but I find it very tough. And I've always, if you, if you even like low-key mention an interest in something to me, if I want to actually build and develop, I'll always come and meet you. Like, oh, how do you feel about partnering on this? I'm very big on partnerships. So with the podcast, I'd mentioned wanting to podcast years ago, mm -hmm. years before. So we started the podcast in 2017. In 2015, my friend Larry, I had mentioned it, and he lives in Calgary in Canada. And I remember he sent, he didn't forget, like I just, we just, I said this in passing, we were talking, having lunch or something. And he got back home and I remember getting like this package from him and it was a mic. I still have it. Was it Yeti mic? Yes. It was so, a, so it was there. Yeah. <laughs> it was a Yeti mic and this really beautiful note about how like, look, just try and start. And I actually did, but I just, I remember like I sat down and I, I watched a YouTube video Can't and figure figured it. out. And then I was like, will I just be yarning on my own in my room? So I sent him a message. I was like, Larry, I don't think I can do this. He was like, okay, do you know what? I'll be using it to sing. Sing, yeah. <laughs> I was like, I don't want to do that either. He was like, okay, use it to send very clear voice notes. Like, I don't know. I don't care. Um, but I kept the microphone and I knew I wanted to start a podcast. And then I moved back um, to Lagos. I was working as Zikoko, and it didn't occur to me that maybe Zikoko would want to do a podcast. Like it, it just wasn't... You didn't think, yeah. I didn't think that that was a thing. And then I started trying to figure out, like, okay, I want to do a podcast. How will I do a podcast? And it was very simple. I just realized, I started thinking through my head, like, if you are going to do a podcast, what kind of podcast would it be? I didn't want it to be, like, too serious. I, would, I, would, I wanted it to be kind of molded around my personality where I do want to talk about serious things from time to time but I have a sense of humor and I'm, I'm not really precious about anything it would be nice to be able to be irreverent about even serious things I was thinking through the list of people I knew that maybe wouldn't mind and I thought of Ikemi okay. I, I sent her a text like it was I sent her a whatsapp it's still in my phone and she was just like oh actually that sounds cool let's try and figure it out I was like I don't want us to do it by ourselves Maybe we should find a studio. And we went to two, ended up with Midas. One meeting, PD and ABA were like, yes, of course, now. Let's do it yeah. now. And that's how it started. And the plan was, we'll do one. <laughs> Doesn't bang, we'll just <laughs> delete all traces <laughs> and move on with our lives. And now we're going to be five in August. So, yeah. Okay. Um... So looking at like collectives, mm -hmm. so I guess one collective will associate you with is Femco. Mm -hmm. Why is Femco important? Like what was the rationale behind that? Oh, okay. So the founders, Odu and Dami, called me um, in June, June 2020. Mm -hmm. And were like... So mid-pandemic? Yes. Okay. Pre-anything. And we're just like, look, we want to actually before that i've spoken to Odu about doing stuff to support women right but it was a conversation that was just in the air so wine and wine was kind of like a precursor to femco. yeah 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 it was okay. just a, it was just something in the air okay right and she then she started wine and wine with dami and then they were like look we want to move we want to we want to build momentum and do like a lot more stuff and we know different women who care Mm -hmm. that we know that was another thing like it wasn't it wasn't about like oh let, uh, let's be strategic like i know this person i know what they care about i know that they work in this space or they have the capacity to fundraise or they're just very passionate about these things or like let's come together and start doing stuff like for women and it was about education health care like we like it just sounded like my jam yeah. Honestly. And that was how we started. Like, I just felt like, I know, again, Dami and Odu, now they are big women. I knew them from, <laughs> so I went to um, secondary school with Dami. Mm -hmm. And then she was my boss as the Coco mm -hmm. before she left. And then I worked with Odu as the Coco. That was how we met. Yeah. Um, 
and so they called and I was like, oh, of course, that sounds like something I'd be super interested in. And like, I'm so proud of the work we do. Um, our biggest project at the moment is we have a bunch of, have a bunch of girls in school that were putting through high school. They are in Vivian Fowler and I feel like your parents, like, you know, <laughs> school fees is not a joke. <laughs> um, you know, like, we get, this is, this is their open day. Status this updates, is their, progress updates. Yeah, and you know, we go and see them in school and they're like, oh, you're taller and your voice is breaking. And so it's just, it's so, it's so cool to see, like, to work with a group of other young women and being like, okay, this is what we care about. And in the ways we know how, we're going to try and make a difference because the sometimes the the sticking po point is you feel like some stuff is too small if you're on your J's or, but that's be, really what film calls about. That was the thing I'm always ranting about: women's rights and women need this and women need that. And a bunch of women I know are like, oh, let's try and do like tangible things other than talking. And I was like, why not? You know, as an aside, what I just remembered was when you. The tweet you have about like architecture being sexist in, ah. Nigeria, in Nigeria, and like you getting dragged about for that. Do you like, know that there was, a, <laughs> there was a guy I was seeing who is an architect? Like after this, <laughs> he had a whole thing where he, I'll never forget, he stood up. I was trying to explain to me how he was like, Jola is actually like their principles of design. <laughs> <laughs> My mind, I was like, "Wasn't this one they talk?" I beg. <laughs> um, and I remember thinking, "Cause you know what made it funny? He brought it up randomly." I was like, "You know, I want to so talk wait, to you." So were you guys saying at the time? Yes. No, no, no. It was after. It this was after you guys. So he brought it up. Like, so you guys started seeing that he brought it up one day randomly. Yes. This was after. This had happened like months before. Yeah. And then I started seeing this person, and then he brought it up. I was like explaining to me. He was like, "No, come to my kitchen. Let me show you. Let me explain to you what I mean." And so he's like, you know, and I said, but you see like how your hand can easily reach that thing? Yeah. Why can't mine? And then I started asking him other questions about other things. He was like, no, 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 but there are principles of design. I said, I'm not arguing with you. I'm just, I was, I was genuinely asking a question. Like, you know, female input in home design. So how did that, that relationship go? It didn't go. <laughs> <laughs> it didn't go. Okay, <laughs> so, so I mean, I asked a very, what's the word, casual question, but there was something I was thinking about. So when you were talking about Femco, so obviously I think everyone associates Femco with NSARS. Mm -hmm. And we all saw how that moment kind of evolved. Mm -hmm. In hindsight, like what lessons did you learn from it? Like how, what? Did... Um, I, I learned the power of like um, communal belief. That's the main thing I learned actually. There's all these other lessons, but I think, the main thing was like just hope and communal. It is 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 nice to have like self, to have your own self. Yeah. You know, these are ideas I believe in. But it's unmatched when there's like a large group of people who are working towards the same goal. It's like almost spiritual in like the way it's it spurs you on, like the momentum it gives, the creativity it spurs on. Um, yeah, I think that's the main thing. I think. Did it make you any? It, did it make you cynical? Yes, after, for sure. Um, because you know, misogyny must always enter the thing. I think that was the main thing. That was really helpful, and that was really difficult. Um, it did on a personal level. I try, I try not to exude or spread or share that sentiment mm -hmm. because I know it's from a very personal place and I don't want to project that onto other people. But it did, it did. It was also very hard. I was also very grateful that there are 14 of us because I can't imagine what that would have been like if you were one or two or even three. Um, because when a few people are feeling really, really low and really upset and you're crying and you're, you know, there's always, in a group of 14, there's always at least four or five. No. They're like, I beg you. <laughs> Don't mind them. It's just always, and this is with all our projects. All. It's just really, really nice. But I think that was the main thing I learned, that people don't, people underestimate the power of, like, shared ideas, communal belief. 
it's not about 14 women. It's not. It's not. It's not about... People talk about structure and, bro, it was spreadsheets. Like, it's not that. Yeah. It's that there were legit millions of people. Millions. It wasn't a few hundred thousand. It was actually millions of people wanting and hoping and working towards the exact same thing. Mm -hmm. And because you are working towards the exact same thing, like, everybody's laser focused on figuring out how to get it done. And all the other stuff doesn't matter. Um, so that was the main thing I learned. Like, don't underestimate what happens when people are of the same like of the same mind it's incredible is nigeria worth fighting for no i'm just joking i'm just joking <laughs> <laughs> it is it is do you know let me tell you like a very selfish reason why it is so i have a i have a group of girlfriends we have our it's just us in a, in a group chat from secondary school in the last few years, people are moving. They are leaving. This was nobody's plan. When we were in secondary school, nobody was saying, I want to live in yeah. XYZ, right? And our lives are just changing in a way that is bizarre. So, like, there's a... The reality, like, like it's, it's not because my friend is chasing has chosen a career which wants to be a zoologist or something and you know she can't really chase that career in nigeria it's just that the country has morphed into this cannibalistic awful place to be in that people just don't feel hopeful here so they are leaving and one of the one of the things that's wrong with that is how like your social fabric is fraying mm -hmm. so there's one friend who's moving to Canada at the end of June. Now, her sister lives in, one sister of hers lives in America. Another one lives in Ghana. Mm -mm. Exactly. And more and more, she was, we were talking, she came to my house to spend the whole day, you know, we're just talking, just thing. And she was like, you know, she can see her parents panicking that they are not going to know their grandchildren. Or even them, they joke about it, but it's not funny. That your cousin, these cousins are going to know each other from FaceTime. Yeah. And there's not going to be that same like bond or unit. And it sounds small, but when you don't have an attachment to a, a space, you have no investment in like making it grow or making it better. And on a people level, I think that's really sad. Also, there's the fact that if you're middle class, upper middle class, um, it seems like everybody's looking for other options. But in a country of an inflated 200, inflated <laughs> 200 million, because Nigeria is nowhere near that. How many people can run? How many people can find options? And even when they do, like, you still leave people behind, right? Um, even for me, my brothers don't live here. And it's just somehow, it's, it, it's honestly just somehow, because that wasn't anybody's plan. If it was the plan from the beginning, boy, well, it's not, right? I think Nigeria is worth fighting for on a very selfish level. Because being an immigrant, quite frankly, it's not that fun. Okay? It's not fun. It, it can be okay. You can make the best of it. But it's not fun. It's not home. And on the low, there'll always be go back to where you came from or, like, where you really from or, you know, what's your home. So I think on a selfish level, also, the, the dreamer in me has, like, you know, well, it could be so much better. If this was the best Nigeria could be, no problem now. Like, you know, like my dad always says, when you're a parent and you're a realistic parent, you know your child's capacity. You know what they can actually do. Is what you, then there's what you hope, you, <laughs> what you hope yeah. they can do. If this was the best Nigeria could be, do you know what? Fine. Fine. But it will always bug me that with the worst possible leaders. <laughs> like, we, we, we bump up the worst as the, best to lead, as the best of us. Of course, this is where we're going to be, but I don't think, I think it is, if it was the best of us leading us, eh, and this is where we were, we cannot call it a day. But it's just not. It's not. And so I think on a selfish level, on a this is home level, on a level that doesn't really make 
sense because nations are concepts anyway. So yeah. it doesn't really have to make sense. Of course, Nigeria is worth fighting for. Why should people? Why should? Why should the, the only way you can even live a moderately okay life be leaving your house? It's nonsense. It's rubbish. Okay, so I think we're coming to the end. So I just. I have thank God. Two questions. For you. <laughs> I have two. I have two questions for you. So the first one is, if you could recommend three people whose stories you'd love to see on this format, mm -hmm. who, which three people would they be? Number one. Odunayo Ewini, co-founder okay. of Piggy Vest. She is incredible. I think because she's my friend, I take a lot for granted. Mm -hmm. But Odun is, Odun is like really, really smart. Um, and she's had a very interesting journey. And just as a person as well, she's, she's a good person, I think. Okay. Um, so Odun for sure. Um, I don't know why I'm very curious about SARS. The musician. Okay. Taz on the beat. I really like him. I think he's very, very smart. He is. Um, and I remember hearing the love of my life's first breakout track. Um <laughs> What's the love of your life? Reminis. Oh, don't kill me. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Kakobi chicken. Yeah, yeah. I remember being like, who is this? And then hearing stars from like yeah. I, I think his journey is incredible. And then what he's been doing recently with these like EPs with artists like Obongjaya and Loje. Loje and um, what's the other guy? World. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. World. Those the sounds are also different, but they're incredible. He has a really, really good ear. Yeah. It's him. And then this is not one person, it's two people. But I'm so curious. The Adeola brothers. Which of the Adela brothers? So one co-founded, one co-founded GT Bank, oh, and one so founded, and yeah, and one founded Sterling, Sterling Bank. Bank. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And Folan, I, just want I think is he Yemi? Yes, Folan yeah. Yemi. I want to know. Um, so Uncle Folan and Uncle Yemi, if my work calls, you, answer <laughs> him because they did not answer us for several times. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think those guys um, are just really, really. I want to know what kind of household brings those type of people. <laughs> Brings out those that that kind of fam like how are you raised that you both kind of and what kind of beef what bank account does their mother have <laughs> <laughs> what kind of beef but I have a list I have a lot of people that I'm very curious about um, the way their lives and then Obasanjo actually interesting yeah given given his like his current role. Like he's almost deified now because we have suffered. Yeah. So now Basson just seems like, oh my god. Oh, big daddy. -o. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I think those are some people that would be um really like really, really interesting to talk to. Okay, so finally, if you could ask me any one question. What would it be? My why will you leave me alone for God's sake? <laughs> never, never, never. When will you leave never. me alone? My wife, 2014, hello Jola. I need you to write this. 2015, Jola, come here. 2017, so excuse me. Okay, just to be your friend is not a crime. Don't worry, the next time <laughs> the next time I call, it will be followed with dollars. But not <laughs> no. I'm just joking. I want I would ask you, like, because you've kept a culture custodian, and I know like we talk all the time, but I want you to answer publicly. Well, how hard it is? Yes. I think I think it's so bizarre that people think working in media in this country is some sort of a cash cow. I it amuses me to know and people think it's like, not. oh it's just and they also think it's fun. Fun? No, it's not. <laughs> yes. But it's why fun. why have you kept at it? Because you have I know for sure, like this one I know on a personal level, you have a ton of options. So why have you kept a culture course student? So the thing for me is a lot of the things I do are not driven by money. It probably should be, but <laughs> I'm not driven by money. Like I'm driven by like fulfillment. Mm. So this is one of the things I find fulfilling. Mm. So um, talking to writers who get it or maybe getting an idea and taking it from like an idea to a final product, like that appeals to me. Mm -hmm. And um, 
and I mean, obviously, it's very hard. Like, bro, the days where you get emails where someone's daddy is talking to you one way, and you're, just like, and you're just like, yo, it's <laughs> nigga, it's not me you're talking to like this. But at the end of the day, you understand that um, the driver, like, the vision is like not defined by what happens tomorrow or the day after. It's like very long term. Mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. when you kind of uh, motivated by that i think you kind of just drown the noise out you're just like okay you know what um it's not about who's here now or who was here five years ago it's about who's going to be here 10 years from now Mm -hmm. uh, whatever and um just walk into that like timeline or walk into that vision of like okay you know what let us incubate and develop this thing to the best version of itself and then the rest will take care of itself so yeah What's this thing called again? Overnight? Overnight success. Okay, can I say something quickly? Yeah. Please. I started, for you came and I started, I said what I said in 2017. Yeah. First time we made money was in 2021. Yeah. I started my production company in 2018. Yeah. We started our documentary in 2019. It's just in post production now, yeah. in 2022. I, <laughs> I, <laughs> I think when a flurry of things start to happen around someone there is the assumption that they worked smart yeah or that they just lined things up yeah. or that they were just strategic yeah and particularly in this wretched game in yeah. the media landscape it's not tech look <laughs> Those tech boys and girls, eh, were just on their stupid computer <laughs> and a year and a half later, something, something, three million dollars. If only, <laughs> if, if only, see, I have tech friends. When I'm going out with them, my phone is the only thing I carry. Let me mod if I pay. I think that with certain things, particularly in media, yeah. people generally do believe that were being quiet. Our friend Dari, Dari sent me the script for Oji Kokoro in 2014 14, yeah. when I lived in Manchester. He's just, his third, third film, film is just, pre- just premiered. And I think, you know, and he has, still hasn't blown the way he wants to blow, the way he's supposed to blow. And when it happens, people are going to be like, oh my, it came out of nowhere. I think it's really, really important sometimes. I know it, it's not sexy. And also because like when you get, when you, when you mature in an industry, you start to know, learn about PR. PR guys don't think talking about how long it took you is sexy. They always want to gloss over those parts. Yeah. It's really, really easy. Really, really, really easy to take like this, like glossy, like washed out version. I remember someone who was just sending me a message being like, oh, more, only you. New York, only you, South Africa. I was like, bro, <laughs> if you know the sofa. <laughs> you know, you know what's funny? I don't think you knew what you were doing, but you just unwittingly made the trailer for this thing. Oh. Because this <laughs> this is like, that's the premise for me. So it's understanding that there's no such thing as an overnight It's a success. lie. So it's like everyone that people look at as maybe this person just, like things just happened. Like maybe Ooh. the last year, I have a very solid example of this. In 2014, John asked me to write his skits for him. Okay. Okay, and he was like, there's this actress, babe, that he wants to do, give and she's going to do it. Um, and What's her going name? to put it on Funny African Pics. Her name is Bisola. Oh, wow. Ayola. And this was before she went to Big Brother. Big Brother, yeah. And it was a skit about a tailor. And it went viral. I'm thinking, the whole thing, it went viral. And then a few months later, Bisola went into the Big Brother house. And I remember, like, whenever I think about, like, overnight, John always reminds me of that thing. When I get really frustrated, I cry a lot. Oh, bro. I cry a lot about work, be it the podcast or like stuff I'm writing or stuff I'm working on or stuff I'm trying to get done. I cry a lot. People think I'm like, oh man, Jola is doing well or whatever. Yeah. Nah. Um, but it's just, I just really want to, and it doesn't matter what, like, what sphere you're in. You feel, there are many times you feel foolish. You just feel like, what am I doing? Like, does this make any sense? Does this, like, you know things. You are a capable mm-hmm. person. Why is your life like, <laughs> why is your life like this? Why are you like this? That is a normal part of, like, 
work and nobody ever comes out to say oh by the way guys i have 50k in my account <laughs> and this and that and that but there's no such thing as an overnight success no no like even people that say overnight they'll be like it'll be like one year do you know how long a year is <laughs> do you know no <laughs> There's no such thing. But thank you for having me, even though I've been insulting you. Thank you, all day. thank you, thank you for coming through for us. And I've, I've really enjoyed this. So yeah. it, it was worth, it was worth the insult. <laughs> uh.